Devaratayi. Okay, I wasn't sure if we are talking yet or not. Yeah, we're, we're live, we're live, um, but we will uh, um, probably just uh, um, wait a um, couple of minutes because there are five other tracks going on. So um, some people may be, you know, maybe even they're rushing for a quick comfort break or something or a, or a coffee. Um, how are you both this morning? Uh, very good, very good. I have a delivery, one sec. <laughs> Talking of uh, uh, important priorities. This joy of remote working where our home lives uh, I know. Unbelievable. And certainly topical for uh, um, you know, what's, uh, what has 2020 meant? Uh, you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to uh, reflect on that here, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, will you be, um, will you and Barat be sharing any slides out of interest just while we're... Um, uh, I don't think we have a plan to do so, Barat. Are you planning on sharing any slides? No. No, so we can, you know, if, if anyone is interested, we can we can send slides later on. But for the purpose of this discussion, no. Excellent. Excellent. Um, looks like that's good. Some people joining us right away. Um, timing of the delivery worked out well, otherwise I could have been a bit tricky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think we can uh, we can manage these things. Uh, you know, phones go off in the middle of the day and all of that sort of stuff. I know, um, yes. People have. Where are you based, uh, Claire? <laughs> uh, this year has been extraordinary, hasn't it? We now know we now know people's dogs, their children, their um, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. what books they're reading. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> So where, where are you based, Claire? I'm uh, in the UK. Uh, so uh, yeah, I was actually in. Um, although I only moved back here, uh, um, I'm British originally, but I only moved back here in uh, a year ago from Australia. Uh, so it's kind of interesting time. So so was the delivery barrett on your vaccine or something like that? A <laughs> good one. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. They, you know, they, they, they say it started yesterday. In fact, it, it sounds like it's become a European uh, kind of big news that the UK has started vaccination. Um, but a lot of my colleagues today, in every single call, it started off with, did you get your injection? <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's for, the, well, we, for the people who need it first. I know if you're not going to turn green or red or second <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> the, um, to me, the interesting piece on this has been... Uh, um, there's lots of talk about you know, which country went first, and you know, are they are they fast tracking um, governments? There's some great digital um, messages because uh, it sounds like the British approach was very agile, you know, it was very iterative, um, you know, getting data points, moving a little bit ahead, running lots of things in parallel. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder, I mean, COVID COVID worldwide is providing us with so much, so many case studies of of uh, yeah. how the world um, you know, has responded. Be keeping people's PhDs and uh, um, masters, I think, very busy for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Maybe a case where we behind what's going on. Politics joined the uh, merge with IT as well, so that's kind of, uh, and science uh, makes it difficult. Great. Um, I, I think we should get started. Um, it's a couple of minutes in. A few more people are joining us. Uh, but importantly, um, thank you uh, from uh, uh, on, uh, on behalf of um, I'm speaking for the API Days team um, to IBM as uh, the platinum sponsor of this event, which um, makes it uh, available for people in the community now across the world um, to be able to uh, join in here. Um, from uh, you know the latest thinking, um, share ideas, and, and uh, um, be active in the community, which is um, which is fabulous. And for those of you in the audience, I'm delighted to introduce uh, um, Barat and Emmanuel this morning. Um, Barat's IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for the banking sector. Um, he's joining us from the UK with Emmanuel Trenny, um, Director of the Cloud and Cognitive. Uh, EMEA region sales part of the business at IBM and uh, um, we're really privileged to uh, um, join you in conversation today. For those of you uh, who may be at a first round table um, or even at a first API days event, um, we encourage you to join us uh, um, via the online chat. Some of you did take the time kindly to send us some questions when you registered um, and we'll hope to, to get to a couple of those as we go through. Um, we're going to run this session for um, up to, we have up to 50 minutes, um, probably likely to finish a little bit, five to 10 minutes before that, um, probably. 
Um, and join in, join in on the online chat, um, have any conversations. If you really want to, um, you know, you, you can actually come and join us uh, virtually, oh, sorry, virtual video um, and audio if you wish as well. Um, we can moderate that if you, if you want to share. Um, we also understand that uh, depending on where you are, it may be just easier to, to contribute with the chat. So, um, Bharat, I'm going to hand over to you. We're, we're here to talk about open banking, a foundation for the new world. Big topic. Big topic indeed. So, Claire, first of all, thank you ever so much for um, for the introduction and, and having us. You know, we've uh, um, we, we've been a supporter of the API Days um, uh, uh, program for a number of years, and I've actually enjoyed uh, every time I kind of come back and uh, whether it was the physical event in in London or the virtual events um, around the world. I love coming back to this event for a number of reasons. One, this is this is technical community, uh, and uh, and you know you can actually. Kind of jump between business and technical uh, only in this community. You know, quite often it's either deeply technical or deeply business. Um, so I love love kind of having this kind of bridge the the, the two worlds together. So thank you for having uh, having us here. And uh, Emmanuel, do you want to make any initial comments before we kind of deep uh, dive into uh, the? Uh, I think you you said it all. I mean, you know, uh, you, you mentioned API days in, in London, and uh, you know we've been participating. Uh, through the API days around around Europe, and uh, you know, it's always a, it's always a very good, uh, a very well attended, and a very uh, well organized uh, 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 event. And and I think you know that there is no secret that we're talking about API. I think uh, you know API is really one one subject that that triggers uh, a lot of interest for both the business and and IT. Uh, I think it kind of made it it allows us to do a number of things that. That could have been very complicated before, and it really, uh, I think, above all, above all, you know, the fact that it makes it possible really to to uh, to make data available, to to do more, to do differently, to do with more more, more people, more partners, and, and, and trigger new business uh, outcomes is uh, is something that 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 triggers every everyone's curiosity. So that's why it makes yeah. I think those even so so successful and popular. Yeah. So. And, and, and maybe just you know, kind of a, a forward because you know you you you're Barrett, you're you're the real expert. I'm, I'm you know only the 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 guy who's got this kind of pretty broad view on APIs. But but what I wanted to say to jump into the, the banking world is uh, is that to me uh, you know banking has always been at the forefront of innovation when it comes to IT. Uh, and you know without going back too far away, just go, maybe going back to to, to the first mobile applications. You know the first mobile applications that that had a real meaning were the banking ones because they were the first one that really allowed us to interact with what was going on in the background. You know, uh, uh, I don't know. It sounds like science fiction or actually pre prehistory, but you know, we thought it was fantastic to could when we could just check. You know, the balance, our account balance on an application, and you know, and that was amazing because we 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 could interact with real data real time. And that was, you know, huge innovation at the time, and and the banks were the first one who could deliver that. You know, then we kind of move ahead, and 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 for APIs, you know, the banks have been, you know, the first one also to embrace that, to embrace APIs. Some in some region, you know, being pushed a little bit by regulation, and some other regions uh, pushed simply by by business needs. Uh, but again, you know, the banks have been have been the first one. So so uh, you know, now it's uh, banking 2.0. But but Barad, I mean. I guess what's your perspective on 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 that on the evolution and and the place that the banking you know play with the with the with API? Yeah, no, thank you, Emmanuel. And uh, as you as you said very rightly that that you know banks have been trying really hard to keep up with the with the pace of change uh, from an innovation perspective, primarily because as we live our lives, you know, we have uh, I don't know smart thermostats at home and all of these IoT devices, smart. Phones and smart TVs and smart monitors, everything smart at home. Our expectation from every entity that we interact with, whether it's our governments or the healthcare professionals or um, or our banks, has has shifted quite significantly. Um, you know, I think um, so. If I kind of very narrowly look at open banking and what's uh, what's really happened so far, I know we're going to talk a lot more about the future of um, open banking. You, you look kind of when you look back. At um, at the last three years, there's been a lot of change. Uh, on on average, financial institutions have spent 
um, somewhere between 20 to 30 million uh, euros in compliance related projects um, and and compliance to open banking or as it's known as PSD2 in uh, in Europe and it's uh, it, it, it hasn't been that easy uh, there has been a lot of um, foundations being dug and dug again and dug again and again and you kind of as you kind of um, start to implement um, some basic stuff you realize that actually we haven't got X Y and Z and I'll, I'll get into some of those details in a minute so I think the last two to three years have been quite phenomenal in um, in the world of banking first of all the regulation itself is, is you know, I think it was it's it's the telling you of, of the time that we are in the in, in the uh, in the year 2020, uh, where we are able to share our financial data and the technology had come to a point where you're able to apply some intelligent stuff to to give me insights, um, to help me live my life better, to make me smarter with my own money, uh, etc. And there are lots of other reasons that that uh, generally don't get uh, spoken about because you know the kind of the focus on driving national utilities uh, rather than relying on. Uh, proprietary card schemes is an underlying theme uh, from from a regulatory perspective. So financial institutions have done a lot of stuff to to really get to a, I would say, the common bare minimum standard where you have a set of APIs. They're, they're not all uniform because you just look at, I mean, I cover EMEA in my current role. So you look at some of the UK banks, uh, particularly the CMA9, you know, the top nine banks with about 15 brands. Uh, they they all had to adapt the open banking standard published by the CMA and the open banking implementation entity, uh, and a lot of adopted that. Um, our clients in Africa and the Middle East are definitely adopting a lot of the open banking standards. Um, obviously, in Europe, we had um, the Berlin Group and and uh, other standards as well. In Poland, had their own um, standards, so we didn't see a single standard. Uh, for adopting these type of services, and I think that caused challenges for some of our largest um, banks in in Europe that are multi-country, multi-jurisdiction. So, which which standard do you adopt, and how do you make it work across multiple countries? And then you know you talk about third parties and uh, and and uh, and adopting uh, third parties. That hasn't been that easy as well because there was there wasn't a uniform uh, registry uh, for well, for lack of simpler word uh, to create. Um, a, a single registry of TPPs across Europe. So I think you know financial institutions have done a lot of stuff. Now they are here in in the year uh, 2020. They have created the consent management tools, the ability to do two-factor authentication. I mean, I know there are some banks that will still go back to the fallback um, option, but but there are very very few uh, banks that that are in that stage. The next kind of 12 to 18 months, and already with some of the large and I would say the digital savvy uh, banks, not just the startups, uh, but actually in the enterprise space where you perhaps may be working, um, any of the, uh, the the kind of people on the on this session, maybe you may be, maybe with a large bank, maybe you're with a startup, or um, or maybe in in a completely different industry. I think the value for open banking going forward in the next kind of 24 months is in creating those value chains that go beyond um, open banking, uh, go, go beyond the, the bank's own products and services. So we are seeing, uh, you know, we're working on, on engagements where we're creating banking as a service or embedded finance. So there's, I mean, there's lots of words being used to effectively put banks at the heart of other platforms, whether it's an agriculture platform or you're kind of, uh, um, Making payments invisible in the world of um, entertainment or whatever that might be. So the the I think the business focus for financial institution has changed. There's a lot more focus on cooperation, co-creation, co-opetition. You know, anything with with co, whether it's with clients, partners, uh, and even historically direct competitors um, as well. So I you know I think I'm definitely seeing a lot more interest in now we've done this. Let's um, uh, this piece of work in creating and standing up APIs. Let's go and um, generate um, potentially, first of all, volume. So let's get more volume through the front door. I, again, you know, two years ago, most of our clients were worried about will their systems fall over because they didn't have the capacity, appropriate capacity for uh, for open banking type um, uh, solutions. So next 12 to 14 months, uh, 12 to 24 months are all about the the kind of the the broaden the broadening out. You know, looking at the the entire landscape of their customers. Not just you know what what can I sell them today, but actually creating a end to end value chain. Mm. Uh, so so, so um, uh, on, on that, I mean, um, 
I, I think you know what we call, and I see a, a question here, you know, about you know open banking 1.0. You know, it's kind of a general term uh, where we saw the convergence of the technology and and kind of uh, 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 the decision to to finally kind of open up data and to make it available. I think, uh, I mean, again, looking back a little bit, you know, the, 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 just the thought that banks could make the data of their clients available to be kind of used, of course, with the regulation and security in place, but you know, these data to be used to do other things, to trigger payments and to, to, to do some, some conversions. I think it's really the conversion of, of a technology, which is API, that came to kind of a, a level of maturity that allowed us to do that, especially when it comes to, to managing the APIs, but also uh, to, secure, to secure the data. And, and then, you know, the, the, the willingness to do it. And that's where, you know, we, we see it's interesting because, uh, again, you know, open banking 1.0 is uh, there are a you know certain amount of APIs or type of APIs and data that will be made available. Uh, when 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 you when Europe uh, decided to go for the uh, PSD2 regulation and to force every single bank, uh, if they wanted to to do business in Europe, to uh, to, to make these data available. We saw that in other markets, in other countries, uh, this, this had already ha happened. And, and in fact, you, you saw that this happened in some countries where uh, there are far less regulation that you could see, uh, that, that you could see in Europe. And it was, it was interesting to see the really conversion of technology, uh, regulation, and, and, and the business need. Um, and, and, and as you said, you know, now I think the banks are ready, everybody's ready, you know, and, and now that we've done the things that they were mandated to do, everybody's kind of taking a step back. Okay, we've got the technology, we know it works, and now it opens up, you know, the field of possible op open banking 2.0 is pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, and it will be, as you said, you know, embedding uh, uh, banking services into, you know, any, any, any service you may think, you may think of because it becomes available. And, and I think it has also opened a new field of competition uh, between the banks. You know, they were competing, you know, kind of a very standard ways on, you know, the rates that they had for the loans or, or, or things like that. But suddenly they, 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 they became really competitors in a kind of complete different field. You know, one that, one that I like a lot is uh, the, one of the first uh, uh, results of, of this uh, 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 PSD2 was the fact that you can aggregate one application all your your banking services coming from different banks and it was kind of a lot of competition you know just to see you know who, who would pick up uh, the other the other's clients I really like uh, go ahead Claire no, I was um, actually just continuing on the open banking 1.0 and um, Boris has been putting some questions in the online chat, which we'll certainly need to get to quickly. But I do think this um, context setting is always critical. Um, the, the interesting thing, uh, I'd, I'd be curious on your perspective about the original open banking uh, proposition to me was, was always twofold between the um, uh, ability to um, uh, provide uh, more transparency and competitive in the market competitiveness in the marketplace in terms of visibility of you know, banking opening up uh, new ways in which people could experience things but also this financial inclusion um, social responsibility angle um, which sometimes feels has been a little bit diluted over over time I'm, I'd be interested in your perspectives on how maybe Open Banking 2.0 is going to bring that perhaps a little bit more central you know, central to thinking. We've got this huge economic impact um, globally of COVID. You know, next year everything you know is changing so much. What, what are some of your thoughts? Um, what are you hearing in your customers? Um, I'd be really interested to. I'm sure, I'm sure the people here may be interested in. Yeah. So, so um, Claire, COVID nineteen. Um, Tested the operational resilience of um, of our clients. Uh, I think it's really tested the, the 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 strength of the organization from being able to serve their customers, being able to get people in the call center, um, uh, setting up um, uh, home working environments. I mean, initially, my my clients were worried about will there be enough network bandwidth. 
uh, in the kind of the general broadband uh, infrastructure because you know everyone is at home people are kind of doing all sorts of things at home so will there be enough bandwidth to them enabling the staff and giving them access people th who worked in branches um, the ability to get them to work from home so I think COVID-19 has really accelerated a big cultural and technical change I mean we've seen we've seen technical projects actually start on a Monday and go live on a Friday in a large multinational bank, uh, which historically didn't used to happen. So I, I do think that, uh, and that also changed the way that people operated. So rather than being face to face, you know, what can we do uh, to make the most of kind of digital um, collaboration with our clients, partners? Can we create opportunities both for the startup community and for the financial institutions? So I do feel that um, uh, that COVID-19 has, um, has has accelerated the the digital transformation in the in the world of financial services and the data backs this up as well. So you look at some of the Open Bank UK OBIE's uh, website, uh, and um, uh, and uh, I know Anthony, you you put the link up uh, there. So have a look at some of those stats that they publish on a monthly basis. The the graph uh, which shows the number of people using open banking services since the beginning of the the, the kind of the pandemic has really accelerated uh, again because people need to be you know, better with money. They need to understand the impact. They need to be given advice, coaching, nudges, etc. Advice has a very specific meaning, which is why lots of institutions, whether they are startup or an incumbent, really use financial coaching or nudges as the as the kind of the phrase. And using analytics, you know, there's some really, really, really low hanging fruit that that you could build up very, very easily. So help me avoid overdraft charges. Um, so you know what my payment schedule is like. You can easily build uh, those models that can that can predict with really high degree of accuracy that you're going to be overdrawn. And if you are overdrawn, you know, can you nudge the customer to, to spend less or perhaps transfer money from another account uh, that they've got? Perhaps you know help, help them look at, are they paying too much? Uh, and this is a very UK-centric view at this point. People here don't change their utility providers. They wouldn't change their broadband providers and gas and electricity providers because it's just too cumbersome. There's like um, hundreds of um, electricity products when you go to electricity pr provider is just too complicated. But can financial institutions, and this is kind of the point that um, we were alluding to earlier on, that financial institutions have to think beyond what current account, what savings, and what mortgage product they can sell to the customer. It's about the experience, and it's about certainly the conversations we are having with our clients is, can you help, and I, I kind of put this in two buckets. One is, can you help your customer save time uh, and can you help them save money and be financially better off? So they live a more fulfilled life. They don't have to worry about finances um, and you can help them, nudge them for the long run, not just in the short term that you Looks like we've just got a little bit of a data challenge. Um, with uh, Emmanuel, okay. Yeah, I think it would be a good, um, a good entree actually to get back to um, the questions that the team answered. Uh, we've had going on the online chat, uh, so um, particularly about the extent to which open banking considers the open mainframe project. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, one one thing to to really. Uh, uh, you know, be aware of is or, or to, to keep in mind when you talk about API is that at the end of the day, you know, API is, is really kind of a way to make these data available and consumable by by uh, uh, developers, uh, those developers being uh, 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 internal developers or third party developers. But now, you know, behind the API project, you know, you 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 need to get to the data, and that's the that's the critical thing. Uh, getting to the data today is not simple at all. You know, uh, 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 mainframe is is probably the the way we use. I mean, it's not probably is the way we used to 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 handle data, store data, and 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 and, and run data uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, but now, you know, you will have data that are embedded in applications that are on the cloud. And big uh, data that are an application that run on a private cloud, on a private uh, public cloud, and so on. So, so, so you need to keep in mind that for an API to provide these data in a secure manner, in a, in a nice and friendly manner, you know, in the background, you need to make sure that you can get to the data and do all this kind of integration, and it needs to be done. And in fact, um, uh, the the 
the API uh, 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 were seen by many clients as a way to unlock data that they had in the mainframe, uh, simply because uh, it would have been extremely difficult in the past to to uh, to, to to make to to uh, extract the data from a mainframe and to make it available using the tools we had. But now with APIs, it becomes very easy. Okay, so 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 that's in that sense that 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 API really allowed to unlock the data you have in the mainframe. Um, uh, but again, you know, anybody thinking today about about uh, uh, API projects, you know, being uh, in the banking world or not, we really need to think about what's what's happening in the background, uh, yeah. which is kind of quite often, you know, pretty complex uh, integration project. But that's the beauty of the API because they make simple something that is very complex in the background. You know, we used to do integration for many many years, and and at some point we were. Uh, you know, uh, delivering web services because we wanted these kind of data to be consumable. So we went into huge projects of delivering web services. The problem with the web services is that they were fairly static and they didn't take into account the business need. So, you know, in effect, it was the kind of IT trying to make a bet on, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this chunk available, hoping that somebody one day will use it. Okay. Now with the APIs, you, we really fine tune and select very precisely you know, the data that the business need. And we can do that with an agility that allow us to change these data, to, 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 to augment them, to, to reduce them, but to make it in a, in a, of course, always, and I always say that in a secure way, but also in a very agile way, and in a way that makes sure that we, we keep a very good level of performance. So I, I digressed yeah. a little bit from the, the mainframe uh, story, but, but again, you know, APIs are really a way to, to unlock the data that you have in mainframe. And, and if I can, if if I can extend, uh, kind of broaden out uh, Boris's um, question specifically about um, uh, the kind of the mainframe, um, I, I broadened out into core systems of record. Um, clearly, some of them uh, will run on uh, on a mainframe, uh, but not everything runs on the mainframe. So a lot of uh, the kind of the core, core focus of um, of what our clients has been on application modernization. So you know, how do you go about creating those? Uh, those consumable APIs that make them available and accessible to other internal systems as well as external systems. And you put these shock absorbers in place to make sure that they these internal systems that historically only had a point-to-point -point connectivity or native connectivity don't get overwhelmed by external systems. So, so whilst, um, you know, particularly on the mainframe, our clients have used technologies like ZOS Connect or, uh, or similar technologies to create effectively you know, rapid pro APIs that could be consumed uh, very, very quickly. But this is actually a much broader uh, thing, as Emmanuel pointed out. Open banking, if you net it down, this has really been about, you know, creating a set of APIs. So it's been an integration and a security challenge uh, for, um, for, for, every, for financial institutions. Um, how do you integrate your TPPs into your internal system so they can have access to data? And of course, you know, they'd be, uh, two-factor authentication, consent management, token management, identity management type of stuff. So they've actually had to renovate their identity and access control mechanisms because historically those were also stored very close to or inside uh, their core banking platforms. Um, so they said, actually, we can't do that. Now we are entering this world of open banking, open data, open finance, we, where a customer could delegate consent and historic uh, kind of legacy systems didn't have that that mechanism. So there's a ton of kind of molding and reshaping of the core infrastructure that has happened to allow the bank to be future ready, for them to be uh, able to work with other industries. And those building, those, those foundational building blocks um, have been put in place, which allows them to do other more interesting stuff. It's it's part of this, uh, you know, get, getting things right for APIs is actually what you need to be able to get right for digitization, which you need yes. to get right your know, broader transformation it's it's, yeah. it's kind of like a microcosm of um you know the not just the technologies but the process the behaviors the cultures the um the funding structures yes. all of the things that kind of um spearhead broader change yes um, yeah. yeah yeah exactly in, in fact that probably leads on to um a question that we had from uh, um one of the people at registration um that they're asking uh, what your views are about um api projects or api programs um, as uh, um, you know, either a driver to Fords, or are they maybe um, seen as 
an opportunity or even perhaps maybe misseen as another panacea for um, driving a broader open banking strategy? Um, uh, is it just a label? Um, what, what are some of the things that, uh, um, that you see people have been most successful with um, uh, in, in spearheading that? Now, I guess in Europe, you're, you know, people have been looking over the shoulders of, uh, of the UK um, to see, you know, to be able to learn from that. What are some of the things that they're learning about how to structure and deliver these programs? I think it's really... Yeah, so, so, I mean, so, I mean, firstly, and it's probably, you know, part, part of the question is, uh, is also, you know, valid for any large organization or any organization that, that, that starts a, an API uh, initiative, I'd, I'd like to call it, you know, uh, because, uh you you have to you have to get familiar with the technology you have to to get familiar with with the the type of uh, of project an api project is and an api project is is not like it like any project i think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something that you need to treat and, and deal with like as if you were building a new product uh and because it's something where you're going to have the it part but also you will you will handle the, the end result uh, like a product, which means that you need to 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 make it uh, um, uh, consumable and consumed by by the developers and the people. Otherwise, there's not not even a point to do it, and you probably will not achieve your business objective. So, what, what a lot of clients are doing is they're really starting small. You know, they they're starting small in order to try and understand what um, uh, uh, you know what they're going to do. What, what they're going to do? They're going they're going to pick. You know the first API example they're going to have, and then they're going to grow that knowledge of the technology of what can be done with it, and they're going to iterate up to a point where they're going to start to look at uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, putting some stronger governance around it, and maybe going to up to a point that where they will put a kind of a center of excellence and 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 really structure much more. Uh, 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 you know the, the the team of people who are going to collaborate to that uh, infuse an element of of business savvy people in order to deliver the right thing and make them work with IT. So I think there's a kind of a a, a scale a scale of maturity uh, where, that you have in your in your in your projects. And and what any client do is they're really trying to find you know where 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 do they fit into that scale and to 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 see how they're going to grow afterwards. And of course uh, the banks. You know, when they embark in a in a, uh, in, a in an open banking project or PC2 project or whatever we want to call them, uh, they're going to have to think about the, the the center of excellence pretty quickly because it's going to be big anyway, and the impact for them is going to be huge. Yeah, yeah. The 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 adoption. By the way, someone's admiring the the sailboat behind uh, uh, behind you, Emmanuel. That's uh, that, that's that's a compliment. Um, I wish I wish I had some more interesting background. This is just a plain wall. Um, so, so I think you know the the every financial institution uh, has approached it in their own way. That the a culture, it, because I think organization and culture has a lot to do with it. If you are a bank that operates in let's say 120 countries, how are you going to operate open banking? Is going to be very different to a building society, uh, which is only serving a small um, area, maybe have you know 100,000, 200,000 customers. Um, so, so quite often, you know, you get into this debate of do you create horizontal capabilities? You know, Emmanuel, you use the phrase um, center of excellence. Um, most of my clients actually have now started using center of enablement rather than center of excellence because what they're saying is that I need to train these silos um, in the organization, particularly if they are also matching them to, uh, and Claire, one of the things that we have observed is open banking has also accelerated journey to cloud. So adopting cloud-based services because, you know, it's... Um, as you can you can build out these sandboxes and and your developer portals etc very quickly on multi-tenanted uh, public cloud environments right so you kind of keep creating that edge of the iceberg is is kind of splitting away and, and moving to the cloud um so in that context what we saw was um the, the there's no single group blueprint that works for everybody it has to be based on that organization and where does the power sit is the power uh, politically in that in that vertical, whether it's uh, it's a product-based silo or, or technology-based silo, or is it distributed? So, yeah, and and lots of lots of good and bad ways to do it. But one thing, kind of Emmanuel touched on, is that agility aspect. So it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as the organization is agile enough and without losing any of the good governance that they have to, uh, that financial institutions particularly have to have to make sure that things are working. Because these APIs, 
um, have to have the same level of SLA as their um, online services, right? So it's not something that they can just ignore. So proper governance is is important, uh, but but there's no single blueprint. There was kind of all seen uh, all all sorts of combinations and, and permutations here. And and that's always the risk, you know, uh, when you start these things to um, and especially when you start to put your data, you know, outside of your your your, your organization that you want to over, overdo it when it comes to governance and security and everything. I mean, of course, security, you can't, you, you rarely overdo it, but you know, the rigidity that you can easily put around that because you're a little bit concerned about what you're going to do. But yeah. you have to always, you know, remember that it, it is all about agility. You know, if it takes too long, you know, to put an API out or, or to or, or to iterate and make sure that you, you deliver what your client do, then you, you defeat defeat a little bit the object, and that is why, uh, uh, in, including the banks, we see a lot of them starting with uh, internal facing APIs, you know, as, as their first project, in mm -hmm. order to really kind of be self-contained, really to get used to the technology, to get used to it, and to and actually there's a ton of benefits. In the, the, into developing APIs internally, of course, because you know you and all developers, you know, they, they access the data faster. I mean, you know, they get all the same advantages as as an external de developer would. But you keep that inside first, and then after that, you know, you you bring you bringing outside, and that's kind of a a, a path that a lot of clients are are, are taking. For sure. Yeah. There, there's a comment from. Um from one of our colleagues, uh, is open banking tutored or the same term as banking as a service? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think it's, it's it's all about embedding banking services in other platforms uh, and not just worrying about your own products and services. Um, now this is uh, open banking tutored or is not an industry term, we've just kind of made it up on the on the fly, so don't want to confuse it with any of the standards that are that are being published by various regulators. Uh, the other aspect of um, of kind of product versus API is that um, as you kind of get into the business platforms and uh, and marketplaces ecosystems type of conversation, um, it becomes very clear that you need to be able to have the ability to bundle your products, uh, whether it's in form of APIs or something like that, right? So you need to be able to bu bundle your products and services, and that again goes back to can your core systems or record uh, support that so where you are saying, okay, with my account, I'm just making some of these examples up. In, with my account, I'll provide um, healthcare as a service, uh, as a part of this premium account or Netflix or you know whatever as a service capabilities attached to this account. So in that context, not only you need to be able to manage that, being able to onboard your customers for those third party products, but also have the billing settlement uh, capabilities as well. So you, you kind of start to look at, and that only happens, that only that is only possible if you have a proper, um, digital organization, i.e. your kind of core systems. You have many, many uh, sets of APIs, either domain-driven or pattern-based uh, 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 based, based design. So, you know, we are fantastic partners with uh, Bayan, um, uh, and we are seeing many of our European clients adopt Bayan services for their data models and domain-driven uh, design, which is embedded, which you will start to see embedded in some of our products uh, to create pattern-based development and, and, and stuff like that. So it becomes an accelerator for you to create those APIs. Um, so I think you know, the, the, the business side of the, the bank is thinking about, okay, how do I bundle my products and services, either my own products, or I partner with a FinTech, partner with a, um, with a, uh, with a company in another industry, but that would require kind of your core application modernization and other services that you perhaps have not built as a part of compliance-only projects for open banking. But you have done those as a part of your broader digital transformation. Absolutely. Um, I'm um, conscious that we're actually getting closer to, to time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Our conversation's been, uh, uh, been fantastic. i just check whether anybody's got any more questions on the chat. Um, I, uh, I did think um, I might, I feel like, just perhaps invite you to to, to think a little bit. The, the theme of the conference has been about uh, new normal or, or, or thinking about the world beyond um, this strange, um, extraordinary 2020 that we've had. Um, I, I was wondering from um, a transformation and enablement perspective, if we were having, sitting here 12 months ago um, and talking about, uh, you know, what does the next five years of change look like? and um, how many of the things that we've seen happen in these you know, days and weeks that you've talked about 
um, uh, that would have been, you know, in the five month, five year horizon that have now already kind of done and done and dusted this year almost. Um, uh, you know, how would you sort of sum up some of, some of those things that um, you're seeing? Your know, clients are going to now, you know, have, have become the foundations because of a necessity. Well, you know, I think, you know, one, one obvious thing is that, uh, you know, the, the year that we've been through have accelerated hugely uh, online payments, right? Uh, now, you go to anywhere, any market on the street, they will, you know, ask you to do, you know, a, 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 a contactless payment, if not even, you know, mobile phone payment, which in some regions in Europe would have been unthinkable to really deploy that, that fast. Uh, over the over the past uh, over the past year, and and uh, you know uh, we we know that uh, uh, we there are some countries in Europe where uh, uh, banknotes are kind of on the way to disappearing, and I and I think again uh, uh, these 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 uh, these crises that uh, we, we're going through uh, you know has accelerated that uh, greatly, and 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 I think you know. The, the 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 other one is the the online uh, online shopping that is happening where you know uh, uh, being able to trigger payment you know without taking too much time to put to put in place all these processes has been you know super important and again i think uh, uh, the fact that uh, we went through a uh, psd2 or open banking version 1 or whatever uh, 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 the fact that this was in place has allowed us to be much more prepared to react fast to all these challenges that we have around around payment and banking, we've um, got a couple of uh, um, questions uh, coming through just now, which is which is great. So, um, one is: uh, Do you think open banking is a disruption or a natural way to write the history of banks? Um, and we've also had a question about open banking being more compatible with SEPA or with Bitcoin. So, two two different ends of a, of a debate. Yes. Um, maybe Barack, you could. Uh, uh, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, yeah, sure. To, to so is open banking a disruption? Absolutely, yes. You know, could could we have in, uh, you know, before, um, with, with some of the, I mean, imagine the, the kind of amount of discussions that must have happened in European Commission and EBA and various other organizations that will say, okay, we're going to make this big change where financial institutions will have to share their data, share the, share the customer's data with consent with third parties. I mean, I think it is fundamental. I always often say this to to my colleagues that this is once in a lifetime opportunity, right? So this is this is the this point will be remembered in in, in history if I can be that dramatic, uh, because this will lead to open finance. Um, so today, if you think about open banking, it's all about access to your current accounts, your but uh, some types of credit cards, um, and um, uh, and some basic services. You know, where's my branch and what services they offer. Going forward, there's tons of other products. You know, your full types of different types of credit cards, different types of savings and tax efficient accounts, your mortgages, your savings, your pensions, your stocks um, and, and broker account, for example. None of that is included today. So this is a foundation. But yes, it's absolutely a groundbreaking step, but it's only the first step in multiple steps that will happen. You know, well, I, I fully imagine this to be a open finance discussion um in two years time um and and then following that this isn't just specific to financial services i think particularly again in europe we are leading the world uh you think about gdpr that came into effect a couple of years ago that allows me to have access to my data uh, currently and port my data to some degree um, and therefore other industries are impacted this by by this regulation as well so it's not an unimaginable thing to imagine that you should be able to take your utility data and give it to your other utility provider through APIs and say, you know, tell me this is my utilization hour by hour, where you know, can I switch my electricity three times a day automatically? Uh, that gets me onto the best tariff based on the types of stuff I'm doing. So you know, this is moving from open banking to open finance to ultimately open data that covers all parts of our life from health to uh, to everything else. Um, but I think the, the big issue, in my opinion, um, Claire, is that unless we achieve some sort of standardization, this will, integration will be such a big problem that it, it's almost not worth doing, right? So today across Europe, you have over 5,000 financial institutions and you'd probably find 600 different types of implementations. So if you're a startup that's trying to create value, you know, you have to, um, uh, do that integration 600 times, and those 600 endpoints are changing multiple times a week, multiple times a month. 
so you you know this again becomes a very integration and security centric problem so i i'm a big believer in having standardization you know you look at your 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 the, the way that these cards are, are were created you know imagine if different parts of the world had different uh, size of 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 these debit cards or your passports, right? You wouldn't be able to use your debit card, credit card in other other parts of the world. And I think APIs have had to have simple uh, single standard that that is. Um, uni I'm hesitating because I know this is not just a technical debate. This becomes a political debate then, but it has to be a single standard that uh, financial institutions um, can adopt. And, and and maybe kind of circle back with what what I was. You know, trying to allude to at the beginning of the discussion, I, I think, you know, the banks are, are leading the way. Uh, and I think this has removed our fears to share data. You know, again, you know, a few years back, if we had said to you, okay, are you okay for your bank to share your data uh, to, to, to third party people? You would have said no, you would have scared of that. Now, this, is, this kind of fear is kind of lifting. It's not lifted maybe yet, but it's looking kind of lifting. That leads us to other applications, and one that you, you know you mentioned others, but the one I had in mind is uh, is insurance. You know, open insurance is the is the next one. You know, the fact that we're going to have devices in our car, you know, which is kind of uh, uh, broadcasting the way we're driving. Uh, you know, for for, for uh, liberty reasons, you know, for 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 data uh, uh, security reasons, people would have said never. But now, if you tell them, look, you're already doing it with your money you have in your bank. You know what? You can go to the next step, and I think this was the kind of the trigger for major transformation. So I think banking, you know, this transformation on on, on the open banking is actually the, the deflagration will go way beyond the banking system, and mm -hmm. and and you said that way beyond financing. And it and it's certainly interesting to see how different jurisdictions are kind of building on. Um, you know, everybody else's experience, and I know from Australia they they're taking the consumer data. Um, rights view um, as being you know, at the starting point as distinct from a industry-led um, consortium view um, and, and taking that through a, a sort of a government legislation which which opens up as you say these other industries and um, uh, and applications um, from a consumer perspective so yep. um, I think you know you can see really that there has been incremental incent uh, in incremental improvement in um, as different countries have have adopted a, a variety, a version of open banking, uh, particularly as you look at Australia and New Zealand in, 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 in question. Um, so um, uh, we we had one other question, um, and we've got uh, we've just got you know a couple of minutes left, uh, which was the Bitcoin question from ah, yes from Thomas. Thomas? So, so yeah. is open banking compatible with SEPA? Yes, because ultimately, you know, open banking, as uh, Emmanuel and I said, this is about two types of use cases today. So you can initiate a payment, you can access your account information. So to initiate a payment, this could be, by the way, different types of payments. Your um, So SEPA could be the execution mechanism. So you could do uh, a euro payment on using the SEPA platform uh, that, that's supported by the, the Eurozone countries. Um, so that would become the effectively the plumbing. So think, I mean, I think of open banking as a, or PSD2 as a very simple framework. You know, historically, you might have used your debit card, credit card, and it's quite interesting. You may not have paid attention if you're not in financial services. You know, I invite you to look into your wallet right now. So, you know, in your on your bank account, you have at least three, if not more, logos. You have the, the Visa, MasterCard, American Express logo. You may have the logo of your bank, and plus a couple of more schemes you know, that maybe link or uh, other things, right? So I think... What is going to happen as a part of open banking is that you will stop using, and not, not you as a customer, but the, the industry will stop using the proprietary card schemes uh, to, do, to initiate payments, but actually use the, the SEPA payments to use the UK, um, uh, UK's um, kind of faster payments infrastructure to initiate the payment in near real time. So you get the acknowledgement in real time, whether you're buying a, buying a coffee in, in store, you're buying something online, um, so you're really kind of diverting your uh, payments from using card-based networks to uh, n critical national infrastructure. So you're kind of diverting that 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 uh, in in some ways. Now, bitcoins is an is an interesting question. As of today, it's not com not compatible, I should say, uh, because effectively you're not executing bitcoin payments through uh, the existing kind of centrally governed um, channels. But as central banks, and there are a number of European banks that have initiated various initiatives around digital currencies and 
uh, and, and so on. So I'd invite you to kind of maybe, perhaps we can have a separate chat. I mean, we're doing some interesting work in that space um, where you know, what does the technical architecture look like for digital currency, and not necessarily crypto, but digital currency from a central bank's perspective. Uh, but you know, I think in maybe five years' time, Thomas, this uh, you could be transferring digital currency through uh, through open banking. But but you know, we're we're, we're at least five to six years um, uh, too soon to answer that question. Um, um, we are, we are still getting a couple of questions, but I'm, I'm probably thinking we should um, uh, look to wrap up. And I actually might invite uh, invite you each to. Quickly sum up and, and, and let us know how um, they can people can get in touch with you directly. I, I know Barrett, you're an enthusiastic blogger, and um, Emmanuel, I've been through both on LinkedIn, etc. How um, uh, some closing words, <laughs> Emmanuel? Well, no, I mean, uh, so so, uh, well, and again, thank you very much for, for this. I mean, it was uh, Claire for for uh, uh, running this conversation. I think it was very interesting. Uh, you know, um, of course, uh, for, for f further discussions, you can find me and find Barrett, I'm sure, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, um, you know, would be you know more than happy to continue conversation with you. Of course, uh, you know, open banking, as we said, is a was the trigger for for much more to come uh, on the API world. Uh, but of course, as you would guess, uh, you know, every industry is now looking very serious into that and trying to apply, you know, what we've learned maybe with open banking to to their field. Uh, and it, it is something that is kind of being becoming very successful, and we'd love to continue the conversation with you. So thank you very much for attending, uh, and Claire, thank you very much for for running this. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll repeat a bit of Emmanuel. So Claire, thank you for for orchestrating this conversation. You were fantastic. Uh, now pearls of wisdom. If uh, if you if you work in a bank, start a revolution. Challenge your your C suite to say, don't think about just compliance. You know, let's go do something different. Um, and if you don't work in a bank, then think about how could you use those APIs that are available to you free of charge. The bank cannot charge you for these APIs. How can you create value in your local societies? What local problems can you solve? Because I think you know the world is full of problems at the moment, and uh, and we need good solutions. Um, so um, it, I think open banking really creates tons of opportunities, and there's lots of room. Uh, even though you know the market is flooded with fintechs, but I think there's room for for creative um, solutions out there. And you know, Emmanuel and I are here, if you want to chat offline about some of the other work that we're doing, please reach out via LinkedIn and um, and we'll, we'll be happy to have a conversation. So Claire, thank you again for, for having us. Well, thank you to IBM as our platinum sponsor. Um, uh, the, the community would not be able to um, uh, contribute and join in and hear from uh, um, experts like yourselves without your contribution and, and time to this conference. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well everyone. Um, have a good rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone.